So we are here at the Attorney General's office and we want to give you the history, the pictorial history of the men and women who have led this office since independence in 1957. So that's Godfrey Bean. He's the first Attorney General of Ghana and he's an Irishman. He was brought to Ghana by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah and he did an excellent job. Next after Godfrey Bean is Mr. Justice George Comey Mills Odoi, who is quite well known to some of the older people here. He's the first Ghanaian Attorney General and he was also in this office. And then comes a big one. This is Hanin Zimaman, and who was also appointed by Dr. Nkrumah. His name is Leonardo Koswanzi. He was a great lawyer and a great attorney general. After him came um, in the Busia administration, the Honorable NYB Adade, who later became a Supreme Court judge, as a matter of fact. NYB Adade uh, was on the Supreme Court till sometime in the 1990s. And then after him, is the first attorney general who was a full politician who contested for the presidency. His name is Victor Owusu, and he was the presidential candidate of the PFP in the 1979 election. Before then, he had been attorney general right here in this office. And then during the Achampon era, Mr. Ian Moore, who is remembered by many, uh, was attorney general here in this office as well. And then in the same Achampon regime, there was Dr. G. Kurantin Ado. He was also attorney general here. Ghana has had a history of very rich attorney generals, great lawyers, man in this office as attorney general. And the list is endless because here you have the Honorable A.N.E. Emisa, who was also here as attorney general. And then there's a big one, the colossal figure of the Honorable Joe Randolph, who was a very successful lawyer and became attorney general for Dr. Lehman's administration of the Third Republic. There was also the Honorable A.L. Jabate, who was here as Attorney General as well. And then uh, there was also Akins during the Rawlings PNDC era. Mr. Justice J.E.K. Akins was the Attorney General. And then guess who is next? E.G. Tano Senior. And I say senior because he is the father of the politician called Guzi Tano. That's Guzi Tano's father. He was a learned Attorney General of the Republic of Ghana right here in this office. And then there's another first generation Attorney General, Senior Anthony Forsen. And I call him Senior because his son, Anthony Forsen Jr., is the current president of the Ghana Bar Association. But this is Anthony Forsen, who was Attorney General here just before one of the longest serving AGs and uh, one of the controversial ones also, the most dedicated Dr. Obed Asamoah, was Attorney General here for many years uh, in this office as well. And guess who succeeded uh, Dr. Obed Asamoah? The colossal human rights lawyer, current president of the Republic of Ghana. This is Nanado Dankwa Kufuado, serving as Jay Kufuado's first Attorney General here in this office. And he was succeeded by the Honorable Papa Usu Ankuma, with whom all Ghanaians are celebrating his recovery from the infection of the coronavirus. Um, Papa Uso Ankuma is currently Ghana's High Commission at the Court of St. James's in London. And here is another uh, High Commissioner, the Honorable Ni Ayikwe Otu, uh, was here as Attorney General uh, during the Kufo administration as well. And this was the youngest of the lords. The Honorable Jogate was Attorney General here after he had been Deputy Attorney General. The Honorable Jogate is Member of Parliament for Isika Dukaten and he's also the Minister for Railways. And then, uh, the first female Attorney General that we had had here is, uh, is this lady, the pretty and brainy Betty Mould Idrisu was Attorney General here under Professor Mills, appointed by Professor Mills before later on he beca she became Minister for the Education. And this is Martin Alamisi Benz Kaiser Amidu. He was Attorney General after Betty Mould Idrisu, one of the shortest seven Attorney Generals. He was here for just about a year. I, Godfrey Yeboah, Dami, 
Swear by the Almighty God. Swear by the Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. Touching the matter in issue. Touching the matter in issue. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me. So help me, God. <laughs> Good evening, viewers, and story for the late start of the program. It's 28 minutes past the top of the hour at 9 o'clock. This is Good Evening Ghana. It's live, and it's going to be feisty tonight. We do have an educational interview uh, for you and another interview later. What's the story? This afternoon, story broke that um, at the high court today during a trial uh, cross-examination, I thought I had my earpiece, sorry. At a trial cross-examination, one of the accused persons uh, said something very, very wild. Captain uh, or retired Captain Jaffa, who is on trial as the third accused person in the famous Atu Forsen ambulance trial, uh, is reported to have told the court that he had had engagements with the Attorney General and uh, thereafter that a press conference was held by the NDC's uh, Propaganda Secretary, Sami Jeffrey, and uh, Joy FM News, City FM News, all of them discussed that this evening. Tonight, we have the full story and a better story, and uh, that's why we began our uh, show with the history of the Attorney Generals of Ghana and the roles that they have all played in the uh, development of our society. So the story is about uh, Sami Jemfi, the, the Propaganda Secretary of the NDC, the Leonard Attorney General, uh, Godfrey Diabo Adame, and a judge. And we'll be getting that in, in some great detail. We'll be explaining what we know because, of, of course, you know that our lenses checked everything out. So we, we know what Sami Jemfi is saying. Uh, some of it is true, some of it is untrue. And um, we have seen the Attorney General's public response that has, been, that has gone to the media. We'll go through that as well. And then we have more. We have more. We have uh, the judge who uh, sort of created a meeting between the two parties, etc., etc. Uh, so we'll wait for all of that. But now, though, we begin with a short interview. Uh, that's very, very important. Often we come here and uh, people at home also work hard. We go about our business. We have colleagues in the office and uh, we say, we don't understand why this person is behaving like that. Why is the person like this today and like that tomorrow? And then we end up saying, it's a bad woman, it's a bad man, it's a bad girl. Da, 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 da. Apparently, there's something called mental health, uh, to which all of us could be susceptible, actually. And we may not even know, because in this part of the world, we don't sort of take that very serious. I've had people write text message uh, to my videos and say, Paul Adamoji is mad. <laughs> I say, it's okay. Are they right? Are they wrong? How do we know? Okay, uh, so Doc is here to help us. Uh, good evening. And welcome to Ghana. Is this your first time in Ghana? Yes, it is my first time. Good evening to you and good evening to all the viewers. Hi, South Africa. Yes, it is wonderful. So tell us a bit about yourself. So you are a mental health expert, but are you also a regular doctor? Yes, I am a qualified medical doctor with over 10 years work experience. Mm -hmm. Most of my career has been spent in the mental health field, uh, in the department of psychiatry. So, so to speak, I've been sitting on both sides. Mm -hmm of the consultation room as both a doctor and a patient. So my journey uh, is related to being a mental health advocate mm -hmm. who is speaking on behalf of doctors as well who live with mental illness, but for also to be the voice of people living with mental illness. Your book is entitled The Conducted Mind? Reflections of a Convoluted Mind. Convoluted a, Mind? Yes, A Journey with My Mental Illness. That's you are a victim of a yeah, patient of mental illness? I'm not a victim. I'm uh, somebody who's thriving despite mental illness. Yes, that, that's important correction. But why do we call them patients? I, I'm guessing you think we shouldn't describe them as patients. We can call them patients, but I would not want to call them victims of mental illness. I believe that saying someone is suffering from mental illness, they may be struggling with it, 
but calling them a sufferer renders them a victim and is, an, is, a, is a disempowering term. Mm -hmm. So I choose to refrain from saying that I am suffering from bipolar disorder. Instead, I say I am thriving despite it. It is a reality that mental illness can be very debilitating, can be limiting to one's way of functioning and of life. Um, oftentimes people don't understand what it's about. So I'm somebody who's living with bipolar disorder for the past 23 years. Um, it is a condition that many people can joke about, can ridicule, but I'm living proof that you can thrive, you can live a very dignified, winning life with the mental illness. And I'm here, I share openly to give hope to people, family members who have loved ones who are struggling with this, to people who are living with mental illness to have hope. So that's my purpose in this journey to say, look at me. And to be honest, I took 16 years to get to a place of acceptance. I knew in my mind, as I was told that I have a mental illness, but I did not have a full understanding of what that meant for me. So I would fight it. The difference now is that I have stopped being the enemy of my illness. I have befriended it. And one of the biggest things that I do is to confront stigma because I realize that, you know, we have so much in common in South Africa and Ghana and in Africa. There's so much stigma. And at times people feed the stigma um, and then it, it creates a lot of misconceptions. So to say that I am a medical doctor qualified over 10 years work experience and I'm also living with mental illness, a condition called bipolar disorder that is poorly understood to say, I want to also work with people in authority to bring a different understanding and with society as well. You said you had been a doctor for 10 years. Over 10 years. Over 10 years. Yes. And you have disco dis discovered your mental health status 23 years. Yes, I was diagnosed by a psychiatrist. I was 14 years old when I was diagnosed with mental illness. At the time, there was very little understanding about what that was. I could not have possibly diagnosed myself at the age of 14 years old. I was way too young. But I'm grateful that my parents pursued the appropriate support so that I could get quality of life, quality of care as well. My first contact with mental health care services was when I was 14. Unfortunately, there was little understanding. And as a result, stigma became my reality. Were your parents doctors? No, they were not. My mother is a nurse. Mm -hmm. My father has, was in financial services. But I'm grateful that they pursued the route that they took when they saw what they saw. But people try whatever they have in sight in order to get support. So the different avenues were pursued that were relevant to us. So prayer is very important, still important to me. Prayer. Prayer is Spiritual important. Spiritual exercise, prayer. Yes. You say prayer? Like prayer yes, to God? Yes, praying to okay, God. Okay, it's okay. still a very important part of my life, but it does not mean that it opposes, it does not mean that my condition is cured. As much as we have the reality of HIV, people can still pray to God and take their ARVs with mental illness. I pray to God as well. And despite that, I am not cured of bipolar disorder. I live with the condition and it does not mean God loves me any less. So unfortunately, there was little understanding. And as a result, I found myself being exorcised because people thought I had a demon. So that came, so I experienced um, spiritual stigma, so to speak, religious stigma. From a cultural perspective, others said I was bewitched, that I'm too intelligent and someone is jealous of me and that kind of a thing because I was a high performer at school and academically. So, so many things were ex used to explain what was happening to me. What I'm grateful for is that I had at least the definition and the intervention, even though the, the rigorousness and the thoroughness came many years later. But at least the quality or the type of intervention that was appropriate for me was there. Wow. It's a very, very interesting and chilling story. What did your parents see at age 14 for them to suspect that you needed diagnosis? So the reality is that I, people initially explained it away as this is probably teenage hormones she's being moody because oftentimes bipolar disorder relates to fluctuations of mood and changes of behavior and so on. But my behavior escalated. I was believing that there were people watching me, that TV, the television was communicating with me directly. I felt that billboards as well were like that. I was having racing thoughts. 
uh, things, something called flight of ideas. So you were thinking about one thing or the other. It's like you can't control the way you're thinking. At that time, they hadn't picked up that there was something wrong. But when I started to be become extremely paranoid, so that describes something called psychosis. I won't go too deep to complicate it too much. But just to say that the symptoms became worse because no one could see initially what was happening. But when those things started happening and I was saying that I'm communicating with deceased loved ones, that's when there was concern. So as a sim and it can you can say You were saying that you are communicating with deceased like a grandmother or something yes, who yes, had passed. Yes. And you could see them. Yes, I was having delusions and hallucinations. That they were talking to you. Yes. Why is that I don't it's know why it's mental that. that's state. The, that could that's be true. the mental state. For those who it, believe in life, so that there's no, spirituality, absolute, it could be true. Yes, but that's why we have um, the specialists. That's why we have the people who can tell um, the, the psychologists and psychiatrists who can say, is one having a, 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 something that's within the norm of their religious belief systems, or is one de having what is called a religious delusion, um, or having a psychosis? So... At that time, my parents were becoming very concerned and they pursued the necessary support. So, you know, you're saying something very important here to say, how does one know the difference? I was very angry with this concept called God in my mind because I thought, how can this person or being called God house a demon in a young person? Because people were saying, I'm the weakest link. I was very angry for the longest time. But I've learned along the way to make sense of it for myself. What I want to, people to realize is that when people talk about mental health interventions, you, they are not there to make you reject your belief systems, your cultural belief systems. It's to say, embrace the fact that there might be a reality of mental illness as well. Don't, no one is saying divorce your belief systems in, in choice or in selection of uh, what is maybe deemed Western intervention. It's to say, your belief systems are important, but also consider as much as one can have diabetes you take your medication for diabetes you take your medication for hypertension you take your medication for epilepsy but for some reason when it comes to mental illness there's a different approach when one fractures themselves you go to the hospital you bring them flowers you bring support you tell them to get well soon when one behaves strangely the illness becomes the person so there's a lot of stigma and unfairness I believe, and the reality is that when I overcame my own personal stigmas towards myself, I became braver, I became more empowered, and because I have lived experience, but also the advantage of professional experience, to have seen people walking my journey as well, I have a greater level to say, I am a medical doctor, I have the qualifications, I've been working in the specialty as well of psychiatry, but also I have lived experience. So there's no sense of saying, and also I, ha I come from a... So, so are you a psychiatrist specialist? I've trained in residency for a period of four years, but I took a different route after that. I'm doing the work that I'm doing of advocacy work. So I... Well, what did you start training in residency? I'm sorry? What did you start training whilst you were in residence? Are you saying why? What did you start training? Psychiatry. Psychiatry. Yes. You but you haven't usually... completed... Yes, no, I went for four years in the psychiatry department. I was a medical officer since 2016. Then in 2020, I decided to focus more on the advocacy work that I'm currently doing now. And I believe for that... For mental health. Yes, yes. So parents listening to you and uh, um, uh, in the concluding part of the interview, parents listening to you now, what should they be looking out for in a 14-year-old, 13-year-old, 12-year-old, 17-year-old, 19-year-old? to make a determination that this child may need attention. Change of behavior from their norm. So for example, if somebody is becoming more withdrawn, so it, it, mental illnesses come in different forms and shapes depending on what the diagnosis is. Um, oftentimes bipolar disorder manifests at that young age along with the schizophrenia as well and depression as well. Uh, we have a problem related to suicide as well. So if you're finding that the mood fluctuations are becoming out of the ordinary, that it's deviating from someone's normal personality, it's very important to have a high index of suspicion that there may be mental health challenges and mental health struggles related to that. Mood so fluctuations? That are beyond their normal behavior. That's why it's so important that we don't wait until someone's behavior deviates to an extreme where there's violence and being a harm to other people and to yourself as well. So it's a very serious condition then, isn't it? Absolutely. It's very serious. As I said, and, and it can affect society. It can affect relationships. 
It can affect uh, family unity. It can affect all of that, can't it? If not controlled, it can. If not controlled. I like that caveat. You know, I'm asking you these questions, and I'm sure viewers are very interested in this interview, because here in Ghana, there's a, a public celebrity who has uh, informed all Ghanaians that she is bipolar. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens to this young, otherwise very gracious lady is that um, she does a video, you know, this video they do on social media, and then she starts talking about everything that has happened to her and mentions people's names and uh, the whole situation. She's even been sued by some of those, those whose names she's mentioned. But she gets what they tell us is called a relapse. Mm -hmm. And every now and again, she's back on video and is talking. Mm. Uh, how, how would you relate something like that? You know, I empathize because... I empathize with the struggle that the condition is not well controlled. Mm -hmm. I, unfortunately, we're living in the era of social media that is unforgiving in the sense that if you're having a full episode in full view, you, uh, at times it's difficult, even if people know you're unwell doing those things or saying whatever you're saying, unfortunately, it's hard to erase those things and not everybody has a, an understanding. One of the risk factors related to mental illness, particularly bipolar disorder, when one is in a state of being uncontained, is the reality of reputational damage. It's one of the risk factors. So in a sense that you know, you can, you can have a risk of falling and so on. Mm -hmm. But one of the risks related to the condition, because you may be having behavioral symptoms where you're not acting in a normal way, so one of the realities is related to reputational damage. So that can be a challenge. Um, I believe that if people are aware of the reality, I think as much as... This reputational damage you talk about, in what form can it manifest? by conducting yourself in ways that could damage your reputation? Absolutely. That's exactly you saying it correctly. That is what it is. So when we speak about a, a risk assessment, um, so a patient, for example, comes into the ward and they could be a date. So you'll say uh, they are a risk to themselves and making types of risks that one can uh, be subjected to. So risk to self. It can be risk to other people. Um, it, uh, that could be a risk to other people saying things that might not be correct or not appropriate to say. Then it is a risk in a, in a mental state, depending on how you present. And one of the things I have to highlight is people must not be painted in one brush. As much as with other conditions, it can manifest in different ways. It doesn't mean that all people with bipolar disorder will present in the same way. Their symptom clusters are, for the sake of time, I, I won't be listing everything. But it doesn't mean that all bipolar people are behaving as however the public figure uh, is behaving. So it's important to know that they may be showing a symptom, but to not paint with one brush. Um, and I, like I'm saying, I really hope that the person gets the rigorous um, intervention that they need for the sake of their own well-being because it's a very traumatic time when you're in the depressive episode of your illness and you are now recollecting or recalling how you are behaving and you can't undo that. So that is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about mental health advocacy. As I'm sitting here, I'm all the way far away um, from my own country to say, have a different picture of mental illness have a well-rounded picture there are difficulties and to not write someone off based on whatever their presentation is especially knowing that they are unwell in that state so if i may ask are you married no i'm not married uh, if you were going to get married to a man would you tell him that you have bipolar disorder as much as one can say they have hypertension as much as they can say they have diabetes i would say i have bipolar disorder as well it's do not you not recognize the, the culture of South Africa, and, and, and as you mentioned, other African cultures, maybe Kenya or West Africa, if you were to tell a man that you have a bipolar disease or bipolar disorder, he may re decline. He may not, he, then he doesn't belong in my life. He would not be the candidate for me to marry then. Because he will be afraid that you can get angry and beat him up. Then, That's what we are told about bipolar. Unfortunately, um, they would not be educated about the condition. And it will, it, I don't think it's only a gender thing about a man or woman. I believe that the condition itself is still highly stigmatized. I'm very grateful that I have an incredible support structure. I've met amazing people in my life, and they don't look at the illness. They don't look at some gay being in an ill state. They look at me holistically, and they have a good example of what a person with mental illness is. And I hope that people have a, a different perception of what mental illness is about.
if we hadn't encountered you tonight, it would be difficult for most Ghanaians who look at social media and look at this public um, figure that I talk about, the lady, and to think that a, a person with bipolar disorder can't go through medical school for seven years and even begin a postgraduate training. Absolutely. That's amazing. That means your, your bipolar is quite different from the one that we see on a video here in Ghana. That's that very brutal. What we see, may, may I, very brutal. May I share? My condition is quite brutal itself, the one I'm living with. Bipolar disorder um, presents in different ways. It is a reality when one is unwell and it's not controlled. Um, the difference is that it is controlled currently, but I am not having a separate bipolar disorder. The diagnosis, the symptom criteria that have to be satisfied. Mine, I've had many relapses along my journey. I have met many struggles. Obviously, it's not necessarily the same presentation, um, but to say mine is a different kind of bipolar disorder, I would challenge that because there's a time when my prognosis was not good. There's a time when I was disabled by my condition. I was booked off work for six months due to incapacity leave because I was unwell and I needed to rehabilitate. But the difference is that I had the privacy of home and family and support and an incredible support structure in the multidisciplinary team that was providing care for me. So um, I'm here to shift the thinking yes, of yeah. what the condition can be and can do. To say there are people struggling with the illness. Let us not define them by the illness only and only see the illness. Especially, I think as well, if you have an understanding that this person is navigating this journey, I think the onus is on us to have an awareness and a greater level of compassion. I'm not saying to excuse. I'm definitely not saying to excuse. But to have a greater level of empathy and understanding when we know that somebody is in an, is in an ill state. Hmm. Very, very interesting. So, um, when you were in medical school, did you have to stop for two months, three months, or you, you went through smoothly? Medical school was a challenge for me. Uh, my illness would trip me up because it wasn't as well managed as it could be. It wasn't optimized, let's, let's say the word. So I was being admitted twice. And remember I said to you that I was having many relapses. The mm -hmm. greatest amount of relapses I was having was not because of medical school. It was because of maybe the pressures that, it, um, that result or time pressures, lack of sleep. Life can be stressful. It's a very stressful time in, one, in a young person's life as well. And I would be admitted twice a year, annually, um, for two weeks at a time. And a rotation is six weeks long. So if I'm booked, if I'm in hospital for two weeks, have to recover for another week. That's already three weeks off the six weeks. So I am very grateful that I had incredible support in my professors. They knew my capabilities. I was doing very well. I did very well. Um, but obviously, there had to be provisions in the sense of the fact that I'd be away from school at times. So it's not a measure of intelligence. As much as having diabetes, hypertension, epilepsy, you are not measured by the condition. That is just living proof of that as well. So I live with a very difficult kind of bipolar disorder as well, type 1. But it is well controlled. And if it is well managed, well controlled, you can have an optimal life, amazing relationships, amazing friendships, and thrive with despite the condition. I come to how, I guess, is that you in the photograph over there? Yes, it is me. Oh, I that's see. That's my book. Oh, that's your book, yeah. Okay, uh, are there any preventive measures of bipolar? Preventive measures to bipolar. So you can, are there certain foods you eat and that you will not get it? Are there certain things you have to do so you don't get it? Is there a blood group type? Is it a genotype, something? Is there, is there some research like that? You are asking a very important question, which is very important to inform people. So with mental illnesses, particularly with bipolar disorder, it's mainly due to genetics, genetic predisposition and hereditary. So probably someone in my bloodline, in my family history, somewhere in the family tree. I do know of a particular aunt that struggled with mental health issues, but they weren't as overt as what it presented with. So I do know that there's a genetic predisposition. It doesn't automatically mean that my child is going to have the condition. It just means someone who has never had mental illness or has never had bipolar in their family tree, maybe you, won't necessarily bring it on, uh, won't have a So it's kind of hereditary. Chance. Yes. So in, in Ghana, they say that uh, when you're going to marry somebody, you have to check in their family whether there's madness. That's how they call it, unfortunately. And then if they find that your uh, grand uncle was mad in the village, 
then they will decline the marriage because it means that the person you're going to marry can begin to show the symptoms of the quote-unquote madness. That's how we call it, madness. Mm. Is it very unfair to label a bipolar disorder as madness? More than anything, I think it's very sad. I don't see madness when I see that uh, beautiful young lady. I see a, a very capable. And Have you in seen the, her? Yes. The one I'm referring to? No, no, no. I'm okay. not talking about oh, people's okay. names. I'm saying the one that people are seeing on screen currently. On screen camera, yeah. Yes. Yeah. In those genes is a medical doctor. So they, in those genes of what that so-called madness are the genes of a medical doctor, a very capable one. There's a chartered accountant in my family. There's somebody who has an economics degree. Yes, so yes. In, those, in that same family tree are those genes. So I will be very excited and I'm looking forward to meeting somebody that doesn't judge me for my illness and ha has educated themselves about the condition so that they don't stigmatize at that level because that's a part of stigma. Do you still get relapse? I have relapsed. What do you in, in mean? Recently? Yes. Do you get relapse these days? No, not currently. My condition is controlled. Um, I'm taking medication. It's controlled I would by not drugs. be able. So there yes. are drugs available for yes, that. Yes, absolutely. So if you take the drugs, is there eighty percent chance that it will control the the it, there's condition? A, if if you're on proper management, hundred <sighs> percent. Okay. I'm sitting in front of you. I would not be able to sit in front of I you without that. my medication. So, so those who show mental health relapse every two weeks. Suggest that they are not on proper medication? There are complex issues related to that. It could be related to the medication not being optimized. Sometimes people can be resistant to responding to the treatment. Maybe they've relapsed so many times, so it's difficult to control it. At times, more often times, people lack insight to their condition. And when they lack the insight, they reject the support, they reject the care, and then the condition is not controlled. But with optimal support, I am living proof. I'm sitting in front of you. I'm speaking with you confidently and able to advocate not just for people living with mental illness, but advocating for myself and able to challenge certain misconceptions related to people living with the condition. Hmm. This is interesting. Wow. So where is that medicine sold? That must be prescribed by a specialist or is it in pharmacy? Absolutely. I have a psychiatrist who manages me. So I'm managed by what is called a multidisciplinary team. And that consists of my psychiatrist um, who um, administers my medication, prescribes it. I take an injectable medication. I take oral medication twice a day. I have a psychologist who I see on a weekly basis. And I do realize that resources are limited. Um, in terms of access or frequency of getting the care. But I'm speaking on behalf of, of saying that if your condition is supported well and there's the right care, and I'm, I have an incredible support structure, um, I'm accompanied by my best friend all the way to Ghana as well, just people who see me in my strengths and my weaknesses, those people are integral to my care because they don't see some get the bipolar. They know somebody they've journeyed with, somebody I went to preschool with or went to primary school with, and they know me when I'm winning, and they know me in my seasons of struggle, but they don't define me with the condition of madness. So I think the most important part you're sharing with us from the advocacy is the way we respond to the mental. Absolutely. It's a major issue. I think it's really, really major. We call them mad. Yes. It's, it's, that, that term is, 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 the term itself is stigma. It is a label. And so to, who is mad? If mental health is not mad, who is mad? Is there another condition that we can call mad? No. Zero? No. Then you would so call me mad. Bible, when the Bible says that the guy approached Jesus, a madman approached Jesus, a madman from Gadara approached Jesus Christ, what does it mean? Are they also getting the nomenclature wrong by describing somebody as mad in the Bible? He approached Jesus. Sometimes there's so many he things. He was cutting himself with stones. This, this is a madman. Then you would call me a mad person. Then no, I would, you're not. No, you sound very credible. I have bipolar disorder, which is a term that, which is a condition that is often called as madness. That's what I'm, I'm trying to. Um, Can the explain. disorder, when it's not checked, get somebody to sort of quote unquote strip themselves naked in the street? Yes, it can. It can. That's what we call mad. Unfortunately, that that discourages people living with the condition from coming forward. That is why I'm so passionate to clarify that some of the language that we use is not appropriate language to label people with mental illness because it is the very term, it is the very word itself that makes people become ashamed. And shame itself is something that disempowers people and remain in a space of being unwell and they come late or don't get the help at all. So that's why I'm saying that if 
people with mental illness are called mad, then I would fall in that category. And you are challenging me and saying that, but I'm not mad. No, and you're that, not. Yeah. Absolutely. Then that's, that's what I stand with my people then. Can we meet your best friend who followed you all the way here? Absolutely. Oh, please bring, bring the best friend in. Whilst you get some text messages, let's do one of each. Uh, Antoinette and your team get a text messages. It's okay. Let's uh, walk onto the camera and uh, come and take the seats by her friend. Uh, and then we can say congratulations to her and thank you very much for... Uh, what's her name, by the way? Tommy. She can pass behind me. I think it's faster here. That's Tommy. Right. I had brought you a copy yes, of my. I had brought you a copy of my book. It's in my bag. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I get that. Please sit. Uh, yeah, there. Yes. Okay. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. You don't have a mic, so they can't hear you. Uh, can you put take, take a good photograph of her so that our viewers uh, can see it? Yeah, they're doing that. There you are. There you go. So uh, thank you so much uh, for coming. Is your first time in Ghana? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Are you enjoying Accra? She says she's she loving a cry and enjoying it. Have you had fufu or kinke to eat? I haven't had fufu many a time. Oh, you've had fufu? Ah, I see. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Do you have some messages for her? Let's, let's wrap it up. Yes, Antoinette, what are people saying? Okay. So, um, actually, Abdul Majid has a concern. Um, he says, good evening, Paul. I have a daughter who will be five years in September this year. She always sits quietly alone when her colleagues are inviting her to play along. Sometimes, too, you would see her do things beyond imagination. Her teachers even complain about her behavior of dissociating herself from her colleagues, which is not her usual behavior. What is your advice, doctor? Another one, or you want her to answer that? Yes, madam, you can answer that. Yes, I'm happy to answer that. Yes. So my response to that, I want to create an awareness that mental illness can present at very at a very young age, as, as young as um, three, four years old. So it's, we have child psychiatrists, child psychologists who are trained to manage such presentations. So I would encourage you to pursue, to take your child to the nearest mental health care facility and describe what you are seeing. And that is what will be helpful. Right. Okay, another text. Uh, um, Ella, what do you have? Okay, so. This one is also from Kofi Ose. He says, this is an amazing discussion, Paul. A lot of people need these support systems in our society. It is important for people who have the expertise the expertise and our living testimonies to come forward and share their beautiful stories. Thank you for this particular interview. Patty. So All right, so Samuel Kelly also says, as a health personnel, I would say anyone who attends hospital for treatment is called a patient, and in the mental health, the person is called client. I want to add to what the doctor said, that these are various levels of diseases. Some are even not noticeable, just like autism. We have various degrees of all diseases, but as cited by you, psychosis is also a disease like headache, stomach problems, and as the doctor said, same as diabetes and high BP, which can be cured. Back to you, Paul. Wow. Okay. What's your, what's your, I, I got a message from somebody who says that, I should give your number to them. They want to tour the... Um, uh, it says, please give my number to uh, the lady, the doctor. I have events coming up and I want her to speak about it. I need her contact as well. I want to tour high schools with her in Ghana. Unfortunately, she's not in Ghana for that long. She's continuing her advocacy work around the world. When, 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 according to your calendar, when do you come back to Ghana? When I'm invited. No, but the, that's the truth. Um, this is the start of a journey with, Ghana, with the country of Ghana. Um, I was, I'm the, men, I mean, I'm the a mental health ambassador for the Melody, the psychiatric unit in Accra. I was invited by, by Professor Ofori um, Atta. Mm -hmm. We met at a conference last year and we just connected so wonderfully in such an authentic manner. So I would not say that this is the end of me being in Ghana. Yes, my stay has actually come quite fast. The days have gone so fast, it's unbelievable. But it's the start of many visits, so we can always arrange. And I've shared my details, my website, where people can read more about me. Um, there's my social media where I'm, 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 I'm advocating. I speak about it. I have a Facebook account, Instagram, and vocalmentality.com. So they can definitely reach out on those platforms. And oh, that's respond. the book. Uh, do you have, is this selling in Ghana somewhere? Um, it's available Reflections on... on the Convoluted Mind, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Is it selling in Ghana? It's available online. Currently. It's online. Okay, okay. Yes, okay, on okay. Amazon.com. Amazon. All right. And people can get it. Yes. Wow. 
Great. Excellent, Doc. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so uh, much. We will just put this on social media. So we'll send you a video so you can put it on your website as I'd well. I'd be grateful. Yeah, and then we can do that. Okay, viewers, we'll take a short break. When we come back, that we continue with the rest of the program. It's, it's such a delight uh, having heard the studio. And I hope we've all learned lessons from it. Uh, from today, we don't call uh, such people who have such conditions, same as uh, high blood pressure, same as diabetes, same as HIV. We don't call them mad. They have a mental condition. I'll be right back after the break. All right, welcome back to the show. And uh, we are ready with the, uh, the controversial story for today from the High Court. Before then, though, let me just show you this. Uh, the other day, when there was a political campaign, Dr. Baumia and Anna Kufado were going around in 2020 or 2016, and they promised uh, the Kaya people that they were going to get hostels for them. Of course, we know what the response uh, from their opponents were. They said that they can't do it, it's not doable, they won't do it, da 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 da. Anyway, last Tuesday, uh, just at going to press time, we were told that, in fact, uh, Dr. Baumia has turned the vision and the promise into reality, that he's actually gone to commission the completed. Hostels for Kaya it never happened in the history of Ghana. Kaya years have been there from the 19, late 1950s. Kaya years were there even before independence. Kaya years and their activity in Makola markets was there before independence. When Kaneshi market was done in the 70s, Kaya years went there. Abobloshi now has become uh, the hotbed for keeping Kaya years. Most of these Kaya years, as we call them, are young women who have come from the north in, in pursuit of a better life. Uh, a lot of it has reduced because of free SHS, uh, we must admit. So a lot of them can now after GSS, when they are in their mid-teens, they can go to free SHS and perhaps find something to do later on different from Kaya. But by and large, historically, a lot of these young women have come to Accra to be head porters. That's what they call them. Uh, head porters in the market, they carry your stuff for you and you pay them, stuff like that. Uh, they come with empty hands. They don't have anything. So they really don't have a place to sleep. So what they do is that they actually sleep in the market. The market where they work is where they sleep. In so doing, they are taken advantage of by all the men who are hanging around the market. Some of them are junkies, unfortunately. They take advantage of them. They impregnate them. They have children. They don't know where the father is. All of this goes on because these guys, uh, after the day has closed, their activity, their life, and their destiny is left in the hands of the vagaries of the weather. The weather can fluctuate anyway. So this is what was happening. This is the compassion with which Dr. Balmian moved and said that it is important for the government to take a decision. That these people are Ghanaians, whether you like it or not. Even if they are not Ghanaians and they are from Niger or, or they are from Burkina Faso, they are here discharging a service to majority of people who are Ghanaians. Let us find a way to put something in place for them. And so he said, he proposed that the Kaya should have something like a place they can stay, just, just to stay, and have uh, purer sanitary conditions so that they can live a healthy life. If they have children or when they have children, they will generate and grow these children in a much better sanitary condition than before. And so, uh, on uh, Thursday, Tuesday, Dr. Baumia went to commission this. And uh, what, what did they put here? Uh, the main objective of this KIA empowerment program is to empower the headquarters across the country with technical and, advo and vocational skills. Also, when you want to put them together and give them some training, maybe training in how to sew and stuff like that, you really can't find them because they don't have a place to stay. So, if you go and look for them, they are not there. They are carrying a headpan somewhere. When they've come back, they are too tired to listen to you telling them that they should go and train something. But if you put them in a the hostel, it's easier to get them. And so this, this is them. This is a team that worked on it. You can see Dr. Baumia in the middle. Now, uh, this is the classroom for the Kaya's. This is it. Now, anybody should tell me this is a bad thing. Anybody should come and tell me that this is a bad thing. They say Baumia is a liar. He's, he's Christian by day, Muslim by night. This is what he has been able to achieve. This is what he's done. And Kaya's have been there from Kwame Nkrumah's time. We know that. Uh, the, all the successive governments that have come after Kwame Nkrumah have seen the Kaya's, including the socialist governments and the revolutionaries who I'm always quarreling with. They saw the Kaya's. They didn't do anything for them. They just came to shout slogans on us. I don't want to start talking about them. I'll be too angry. I'm very, very angry with revolutionaries of 1979 and 81. They know that already. So everybody saw it. They didn't do anything about it. Al-Haji Muhammad Dubaumi and Anna Kufado thought that this should be that. Akufado said, Baumi, I champion it. You're the vice president. You can champion nice things. Champion this one too. And there he has delivered it. Al-Haji Baumi has delivered it. This is it. This is him. I don't know how proudly he felt on that day. I mean, if I were him, I'd be jumping 17 times before I go and do the commission. I'll jump one, two, three, up to 17. 
But he was still very calm. Dr. Bahamia is very humble, you know. Even in great achievements, he's just showing the certificate. He was very calm. This is, these are the things that, look at, look at the kind of uh, facilities they set for them. Perfect. Similar to what you and I uh, may have in our homes. Now, this, they have training rooms, they have dormitories, they have pantries, they have kitchen, they have clinic. Please get a Dr. Bahamia montage for me, eh? I, I need to play the original, uh, the one we say, I, I need that one. This is a clinic, this is the washrooms, this is the fire extinguishers, this is the CCTV, uh, and they have 24-7 security. That's Dr. Baumia cutting the sword. This is the edifice. It's sitting in Medina, uh, in, in Sosu's constituency. Now, guess what? Medina is a constituency that the NPP don't have. It belongs to Sosu, the NDC guy, uh, the young lawyer. But it doesn't matter to Dr. Baumia. He could have decided, okay, let me shift this to Adenta, where uh, uh, Adenta today don't have. They should have came to Malidia's place. Ayawaso West Wogon. They could have put it in Ayawaso West Wogon. That is a constituency we have. We won't do it in Madina. We'll do it in Ayawaso West Wogon and Madina. They are borders. And every car you can work in Madina and be in Ayawaso West Wogon. That's what some politicians will do. Dr. Baumia said it doesn't matter. Let it be in Madina because that's where a lot of these people are. And some of them are Muslims. Some of them are Christians. Some of them are traditional worshippers. In Christianity, some of them are Methodists. Some of them, it didn't matter to him. Because religion is not important in the development of a nation. It is necessary for us to have spirituality. But where somebody is worshipping, it's not very important in terms of how you look at them. Every country must have spirituality. And I believe that uh, any country that has developed and any country that is poor, the sine qua non is a certain spirituality that is not adding up for the poor countries and is adding up for the rich countries. It's a spirituality. We understand that. But don't look at people as if they are Muslim, therefore this, they are Christian, therefore that. This is what he did. He didn't care whether the person coming in is Christian from Pentecost, Christian from ICGC, Christian from uh, Catholic, Christian from anywhere. This is the edifice. Oh, look at the delight. Look at the delight on this. Even the policeman is surprised. <laughs> Please, viewers, look at this policeman. He's surprised. He's surprised at how the women are excited. He's shocked. This is what happens when, look at their dormitory. This, this, this guy, their dormitory. You know, this is the same dormitory that students have in the fan stream. They have it in Presec. They have it in Accra Academy. They have it everywhere. This is the dormitory. Mattresses have been procured for them. There are fans in the room. This is the plaque that was unveiled by Muhammad Dubaumia and Honorable Daniel Nikwate Tatos Glover, the regional minister. Of course, Honorable Irina Toshi uh, Adolate, the administrator of the District Assembly Common Fund. And they put the money together and they got this thing fantastically done. Uh, that's Dr. Baumia, I believe, lifting the hands of the uh, NPP candidates for Medina. I'm sure that's what he was doing. A little politics will do, wouldn't it? And so there's a high table. Uh, can I identify them? I can see Dr. Baumia in the middle. Ni Kwate Glover, Irene Atoshi over there. And, uh, and I believe this is the MP. Uh, I don't know whether that's the MP's wife. And uh, Kofi also in cancer of NYEP is also there. And, uh, and they went together and they, 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 they did this. These are the women. And they were, they were, they were, they, what is it? I'm sure they, do, they did some drama performance. Uh, something like that. This is the event. This is what it is. This is how these things work. This is politics. Politics is supposed to deliver the resources, deliver the goods for the people. Promise them that you do this. Make people's lives better. This is what politics is about. Politics is not about just shouting and talking. It is you shout, you talk, and you deliver. This is, this is it. This is the politics. This is how 2024 election is going to be fought on delivering. This is what Dr. Baumia has done. He has delivered it. President Mahama was there. President Kufo was there. Everybody was. Everybody saw the Kayayus. Every president in the Fourth Republic knew the Kaye problem. Every president in the Fourth Republic used the Kayayus to campaign. Every president in the Fourth Republic was expecting the Kayayus to vote for them. Nobody thought about where they would sleep. It's Alaj Muhammad Baumia and Anakufado. They thought about these Kayayus who are coming from there. Where will they sleep? Your, your candidate didn't think about it. Maybe you're watching me, your candidate thought about it. I don't know who is your candidate. But this Alaji Baumia who has delivered it. Anyway, play the montage. Play the montage and let's get to this. The Republic versus Kessel at Forsen. Okay, big deal stories going on today. 25 minutes past 10 o'clock. Good evening. Welcome to the show. Now, this is the story that is going on, uh, the big story for this evening's uh, news at the close of day. Kessel Atu Forsen, the minority leader in parliament, former deputy minister of finance, is on trial for something about ambulance. So you know the story about the ambulances. We had heard during the present Mahama era that government was going to procure an ambulance for each district or each constituency, some story like that. 
uh, the Mahama era ended without these ambulances being procured. It appeared that the discussions for the ambulances had, had, had started um, through Parliament and through the supplier, a company now we know called Big C, with a representative of, uh, in the person of uh, Captain Retired Jakpa. Nice guy. You know I like soldiers. And uh, I think Jakpa was a Reiki officer. I think so. So, yes, uh, I, especially uh, Reiki people, I like them. All right. So, Captain Jakpa is a, is, a, is a former military officer, but he stopped the militaries into business, and he sort of represents this company called Big C. The allegation is that uh, letters of credit were exchanged and somehow some amount of money was committed to the process and no ambulance came out of it. So that's the subject matter of the trial. That has been going on for a while. Okay, Slato Forsen involved. Many, many, many people have been talking about this trial in different, different ways. Okay. I have to confess to viewers that even me, uh, because I happen to know the Attorney General, as many people or those of us who were in Legon at the time he was there all know him, um, I have had people telling me that, shall I tell your man that this is a too forcing matter? And occasionally, have, I don't like to talk about his work like that, but especially unfinished work. But occasionally, I've chipped it in and I say, oh, chief, this is your matter. He just smiles. He doesn't say anything. And I've done it more than once. And I've told the people that I, the matter is in court, but I've told him about it. And, and he has had a lot of pressure on him over different cases, including especially this too forcing one. Anyway. So today in court, whilst the matter is going, we have to say that there are three accused persons. One of the accused persons is gone. The prosecution have released him from the, uh, from the matter. I'm not, I, I'm not so sure why, but the, 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 both parties are aware that the prosecution has asked one person to step down. He's no longer being prosecuted. Uh, now, Atul Forsen is still being prosecuted with, um, with uh, Jakpa. So today in court... During a, I don't know whether it was examination in chief or it was cross-examination, I think it was examination in chief. During uh, Jacqua's interview by his lawyer uh, before uh, her, her lordship, uh, Justice Ifya Sewa Scott, the, um, the accused person appeared not to be forthcoming with information. And I'm, I'm quoting my reporters who were in the court. The accused person appeared not to be forthcoming with the information. And then the attorney general is reported to have said something. And then the accused person got angry and said, was it not you, Attorney General, who called me or met me and spoke to me and directed that I should tow a certain line of action so that it would be easy for you to release me and for you to incarcerate Atto Forsen, something along those lines. Just about midday or so, that, that statement from Jakpa was making the rounds on social media. I got a message all the time. People were texting me. In fact, the people who started texting me on this were Ghanaians who live abroad. They started texting me first. I don't know whether the trial was being followed on social media by somebody or something like that. But yes, this, they were texting me like that. So I saw it. And I forwarded it to friends of mine. I said, what's happening in court? And then they said, don't you have a, I said, I have a reporter there. When we close, you tell me. Okay, so the reporter came and said, this is what happened. They, 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 then the guy said something like that. But I asked the reporter that, so in terms of the record, what went into the record? He said he's not sure. Of course, he won't be sure. But then it's made the news big time. So this is the story. The story begins with um, Godfrey Dame, Kesalato Forsen, and Jakpa. We're going to tell you everything. Before we go on, let's see what Sami Jemfi, the uh, propaganda secretary of the NDC, um, what he told reporters outside. Of course, he's an interested party. Atu Forsen is a minority leader. He's an interested party. That makes sense. So, Sami Jeffy was in the court. After the court, this is what he told reporters. We have, times without number, explained why we think that Honorable Atu Forsen is innocent and that this whole case is needless. Now, the matter has been before the uh, courts. Um, various witnesses have been called. The minority leader himself has opened his case and closed his case. Uh, currently, the third accused is being cross-examined by lawyers for the minority leader who is the first accused. And uh, today, cross-examination was done by our own director legal, um, Eduji Tamako. So we're all in court to monitor the proceedings. But we were shocked to the marrow when the third accused under cross-examination disclosed to the courts that the Honorable Attorney General has been reaching out to him, calling him over the phone, that he has met with him in person, and that the Attorney General has been asking him to give false testimony to the courts and skew 
his testimony in such a way that corroborates the case of the Attorney General against the first accused, so that the first accused can be convicted and jailed. He said this in open court and asked that it should be put on record. And um, her ladyship also directed that same should be captured by the record. And so what we are talking about is something which is on record. And we as a political party are totally scandalized and disgusted by this development. All right. We as a political party are totally scandalized by this development. Okay, whilst I'm at this, producer, please get me President Mohammed's concern, the video on security agent. That's later. But get me that so that we don't forget. All right. At Sami Jeffy said, we as a political party are scandalized. Scandalized by what? The allegation, and which is what the guy said in court, is that this is Mr. Jaqua here. Mr. Jaqua here told the, uh, the, the lawyer in cross-examination, he mentioned it, in cross-examination, that uh, the Attorney General has been urging him to fashion out a certain testimony and evidence. Jaqua is the one on the bottom right. And K. Salatu Forsen is the one on the uh, upright. And the uh, Leonard Attorney General is the one on the left. Jaqua on the bottom right is reported to have told the court that the Leonard Attorney General has reached out to him so that he may fashion his, uh, he may fashion his uh, evidence and testimony uh, so that the evidence and testimony that he gives will form the ammunition that the Attorney General needs to convict Case Latu Forsen. This is the story that he told the court in the mathematical equation. He says, Attorney General spoke to me. This is Attorney General. He said, Attorney General spoke to me that I should fashion my evidence in such a way that Case Latu Forsen will be convicted so that I will not be convicted. Well, the two of them are on the same trial and the allegations are similar. Latu Forsen is alleged to have procured some papers letters of credit issues that benefited him uh, so that they could, they could bring the ambulance. The letters of credit were procured. The benefits may have been accrued, may have accrued, but the ambulance didn't come. It took Hawa Kumsin and Anna Kufado to provide those ambulances. We all know that story. I'm sure it's a story that's coming up for 2024 election. We'll do a song about it. Ambulance, ambulance, who brought ambulance, who didn't bring ambulance. Anyway, so this man says, uh, Captain Jaqua says that he was told to, to deliver a certain angle that will make Atu Forsen uh, convicted. That suggests that the Attorney General really doesn't have the Atu Forsen conviction uh, documentation or he doesn't have the case. That's what it suggests. That's what Jack Weston suggests. That Attorney General didn't have the, 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 the power, the authority, and in fact, the argument to convict Atu Forsen. So he was looking for him to help him be able to convict Atu Forsen. Is that not so? I think, I think that makes sense. That's very basic for all of us to understand. All right. If that were the case, let's now go in to see the documentation that has been exchanged between the two parties. Now, the Attorney General already has achieved the prima facie case against both of them. He has already achieved that. A submission of no case from case Lato Forsen, and I believe himself, has already failed in the court. Uh, so what happens is that the Attorney General opens his case. He's opened his case. He's lined up what he wants to say about them. Uh, after he did what he said about them, the court then allows the accused persons to respond. In their response, the accused person has the option to say that, I have listened to what the attorney general said. He has not made any case against me. They will look at the rules of the prosecution. They will look at the uh, Criminal Offenses Act and the procedure and convince the court that based on this and that and that, that the attorney general and the, the prosecution have not been able to make any case. If the court agrees with them, they will success, sustain, as they say, their application for uh, 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 submission of no case. That application will be sustained by the court if they agree with them. If they don't agree with them, the court will tell them, no, we don't agree with you. The attorney general has raised a prima facie matter. You need to answer it. Th that stage has been crossed. For a prosecutor, once you cross that stage, you are almost on the highway. You are waiting for the rest of the matter, but you're almost on the highway. The attorney general has successfully crossed that stage. Now, a prosecutor who is struggling to find conviction... Uh, it's not one who has already achieved the prima facie. That a prosecutor who is struggling to find the conviction is one who is not able to get the conviction properly. A prosecutor who has crossed the submission of no case and has succeeded thereon is not concerned about building his case. He has, he's already really on the highway. At that stage, it is the defense that is chasing the matter. It's not the prosecution that is chasing the defense. At the beginning, when the prosecution makes their case, they have to satisfy everybody that the case has been made. Once the prosecution satisfies the court that the case has been made, from then on, it is the defense that is chasing the matter. It's not the prosecution. Okay, let's move on and see a few things. Now, there's something called plea bargaining, okay? Uh, plea bargaining means that 
when the accused person has accepted that I have done something wrong, but it was inadvertent, man said that, but I've done something wrong. In Jigbe, as they say in Ghana, in Jigbe, but I've done something wrong. So the, the parliament of Ghana has uh, passed a plea bargaining law in Ghana. It was always part of the process, but now it's been made stronger because it's an act of parliament. And therefore, under Article 11 of the Constitution, it's one of the second most important categories of laws in Ghana. Now, that plea bargaining has been passed. The, the meaning of plea bargaining is that me, I have accepted that what I did was wrong, but I feel that I should not be punished for it. In lieu of me being punished for it, whatever laws that has been occasioned, I will pay for it. Viewers, let's get that clear. What is the meaning of plea bargaining? Plea bargaining means that the accused person says, I have accepted what I did. I have accepted it. I'm not worried about that. When does plea bargaining come? Plea bargaining comes after the attorney general has made his case. And after the, uh, the defenses, the defense people have, the defendants, if you like, have tried to challenge the case and the court says, no, you have a question to answer. At that stage, plea bargaining is open to the uh, defendants. So defendants come and say, we have done what the attorney general says we have done. But we don't think that we should go to prison. In lieu of going to prison, we will pay for it. Let's look at the next line of three letters that I will show you. And we'll go back to Samiji. If you don't worry, we are coming. We also heard about a judge's house where some meeting happened. We have all the details. We'll tell you tonight. Don't go anywhere. All right. Thomas Aubin Law Consult. 27th April 2023. A letter written to the Honorable Attorney General and Minister for Justice. It says, Dear Sir, case number so so and so, case number two forcing uh, Sylvester Animana, who is now out of the case, and Richard Jackpa, proposal from Big C Trading Company. Okay, viewers, let's look at this well. They call it a proposal from Big C Trading Company. So it goes as follows We act as lawyers for the third accused person. Third accused person is Richard Jackpa. Okay, the same person who says Attorney General has been telling him that he should come and design his case so that. Uh, Atul Fossil will go to jail and he won't go to jail. This is him writing to the Attorney General on the date of uh, 27th April 2023, last year. This is what he says. It says, we act as lawyers for the third accused person. As you would be aware, the matters that have resulted in the Republic instituting the above proceedings against the accused persons arise directly from a contract dated 19 December 2012 entered into between Big C Trading Company Limited and Government of the Republic of Ghana, Big C Trading Company Limited, executed a contract through its local agent, Jakpa, at Business Limited, of which our client was the board chair and currently the executive chairman. Big C Trading Company Limited has approached our client with the enclosed proposal to resolve the matter. Our client has considered and finds the approval, a, a, a proposal satisfactory and hereby forward the same to you in the hope that it will receive your favorable consideration. Viewers, this is what propaganda can do. You see, we are doing this work. This what listen, listen to them. You heard Sami Jenfi speaking to journalists today. There is some shocking. The whole world must come down. Everything must come to a head because this attorney general is some criminal. The person Sami Jenfi was talking about is the person writing to us. This is one of three letters I'll show you. Write it, and I'll show you the attorney general's response to them as well. Writing to the attorney general saying that he is begging. That's the, the proposal that they have brought. The proposal determining how much they want to pay in lieu of going to jail, that the attorney general should consider it favorably. The person who said attorney general has called him that, come and do your case in a certain way for me, I beg you, so that I can jail at two for sin. He didn't tell the court. You see what Okudeto did on the radio the other day? He went to talk about Obeche Bilam. They didn't tell the journalist that. He didn't succeed in the case. Same thing Sami Jenfi is doing. Sami Jenfi doesn't show this to the journalist. He doesn't show it to them. He comes on the, on the thing and says, hey, Attorney General has called a guy. This is the worst. He doesn't tell the journalist that there's a letter like that. But we will always obtain it. You know why? Because truth will always win over evil. Truth will always win over evil. Light will always shine out darkness. You cannot have darkness and light shines. And no, light will shine out darkness. So let's get to it. That letter I read to you, I'll come back to it. But that was 20, 27th. Eh? Now, 16th May, they didn't get a response from the Attorney General on that one. 16th May, they wrote again, same people, same law firm, citing the same case. Case Salatu Forsen, Sylvester Anamana, and Richard Jakpa. Let's go to that quickly. It says, 
We refer to your letter dated 12th May with reference to the Your letter states that Attorney General is unable to accede. Uh, is that the second letter? Uh, please ask them quickly. Let me get. I, I wanted letter one, letter two, Attorney General's response. So this letter two. Letter one, letter two, Attorney General's response. Okay, so this letter two. Okay, so letter two, I'll not, I'll not do too much of this. Uh, is this letter two? I want 12th May, 16th May. Please, let's get it right. Is this letter two? Let me, I need to look at letter two. I'm telling viewers that letter one, letter two, I need to show it to viewers. Letter two, before I come to the Attorney General's response. Okay, so this is 15th, 16th May. So I read 12th May. Thank you very much. I read 12th May letter. This is a letter of 16th May. Same reference. We refer to your letter dated 12th May. Your letter states that the Attorney General is unable to accede to our client's request to amicably settle the case for the reasons stated herein. In particular, you state that the proposal emanates from Big C, who are not a party before the case. Fantastic. So when they wrote to the Attorney General, Attorney General said, I am not prosecuting Big C. I am prosecuting K. Salato Forsen and Richard Jaqua. I don't know Big C. So listen, they write to the Attorney General back. The man who says, Attorney General called me that I should do my case well to help him. He, his, let, his lawyers first wrote in the name of his company that his company wants to settle. Attorney General says, I'm not prosecuting the company, so forget about it. If you want to settle, come in the name of the people I'm prosecuting. All right. Says your letter states that the Attorney General is unable to accede to our client's request to amicably settle the case before the reasons, uh, settle the case for the reasons stated therein. In particular, this is the one of the reasons. In particular, Attorney General said that he's not prosecuting Big C. He said, you state that the proposal emanates from Big C who are not a party to the case before the court. We, the lawyers, would like to note that Big C is mindful of the fact that it is not party to the case and therefore cannot directly engage in settlement negotiations without the consent or authority of the party. It is for this reason, the lawyers say, that the proposal for the amicable settlement was made by Big C to our client instead of directly to the Attorney General. Our client then informed the Honorable Attorney General that he was forwarding the proposal to the Attorney General for his consideration. For the avoidance of doubt, our client hereby confirms that while the proposal originally emanated from Big C, our client has wholly accepted the proposal. We therefore have the consent and authority of our client, the third accused person, to begin a plea negotiations with the Attorney General. Further, our client has brought your letter to the attention of the other accused persons in the case and have requested them to confirm their support for the settlement process initiated by our client. We trust that this clarif clarifies the matter and we look forward to your cooperation in an amicable. You see, whether you like Godfrey Ami or not, he's a clever lawyer. You can't take that away from me. When he got the letter from them, and any other lawyer will say, okay, let's move on. He said, hey, stop right there. As if he knew today will come. Godfrey Dami knew that today will come. So he told them that, but you wrote a letter to me in the name of some company. I'm not interested. I am prosecuting accused number one, case Lato Forsen. Accused number two, who is gone? Accused number three, Richard Jackpa. It is them I'm prosecuting. I don't know your people. C, big C or small C or blue C or whoever. They should go away. The people write back and say, oh, yes, we know that it is true. But for the purpose of this, we are clarifying this here. He said, we therefore have the consent and authority. Now, this, I mean, if you read this letter, the man that you say that he says that somebody is asking him to do some case well, he was the one begging that he has understood that he has done wrong. Now, if you are an attorney general and you receive a letter like that, what are you going to tell Richard Dakwa to do for you? He just, he, they don't need him. First of all, you have scaled the, the, the handle of the submission of no case. You've defeated them on that one. You're on the highway. And then they write and say that they are begging. And then they are now saying that they who say they are begging, they are now saying that the, 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 the attorney general is the one who is forcing us. What kind of thing is this? Is it mental health or something? I mean, I just discussed mental health, so I'm sorry if I... I don't understand it. Samit, if he showed this letter to the journalist on Tuesday, he's threatening a press conference on Tuesday. Show this letter to the journalist. Read it out and see what the journalist will tell you. And media men, I, I will send my reporters there. Or should I even come? 
Uh, where are they doing the press conference? I'll be there Tuesdays. I mean, if I'll be there, I've missed attending press conference. It's been a long time. I want to be there. And I'll come with the letters. I mean, if he, I'll come with these letters to the press conference. I'll photocopy it and I'll share it for all the media before you start. Then when you talk, we'll say, answer this question. Go and bring your third accused who is talking what he wants to say in court and let him answer the question that as the third accused, did you write to the attorney general begging that you have committed the offense and that you will pay? Did the third accused access plea bargaining? Has he done that? Has case law to force access plea bargaining? Have they done that? I mean, this country, this kind of propaganda, they are taking it too far away now. That's why I refuse to call Samidian Fee Communication. It's a propaganda secretary. They removed the name propaganda when Dambotre was shouting on them. Now they, they, are, they are acting propaganda and then they are calling it National Communication Officer. Okay. So this is another important letter. Thank you very much, Mr. Producer. Uh, Urban Consult. They wrote again. This letter is dated um, 24th May. Okay. They wrote again and said that. We refer to your letter 12th May and the response of 16th May on the above subject. Your response states that your client confirms. Is this letter from the Attorney General? Yes, it's the Attorney General now writing to the lawyers. Very good. He says, we refer to your letter 12th May and your response dated 16th May. And on the above subject matter, which was received by us on Friday 19th May. Your response states that your client confirms and adopts the proposal made by Big C in order to commence plea bargaining negotiations. Your letter further states that you have brought a copy of our letter to the attention of the other accused persons with a request for them to confirm their support and participation in the plea bargaining process. We wish to inform you that the terms of your proposal are unacceptable. Attorney General wrote back to them. So you saw it. They wrote letter one. Attorney General says, I don't deal with Big C. I'm not interested. They wrote letter two. Oh, sorry. Big C is the company. But we have confirmed with Richard Jackpa. He says that he agrees. He wants to settle. We are also going to talk to Atu Forsen about that. Attorney General says, no problem. Do Please yourself. They finish everything. Attorney General says, hey, your terms are not acceptable. Do you know why they are doing that? As I said, because once the submission of no case has failed, the prosecution is on the highway. That's what it is. Once the submission of no case has failed, the prosecution is leading. The defense is chasing. When the case starts, innocent until proven guilty. Correct. They will fold their arms. I tell you, I'll talk less here. He will talk, 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 talk after several weeks. And then they say, my Lord, did you hear him? He has nothing to offer. My Lord, we submit no case. The guy has not made any case against us. The judge will read it and say, by court. This court recognizes that a case has been made against case law to force and Richard Jackpa. In the circumstances, the court orders them to open their defense by court. Pam. When that by court comes, the attorney general has taken the lead. The prosecution has taken the lead. The defense have now to be chasing because the court has said that prima facie, you have a case to answer. If you don't answer that case, well, you go to jail. So the court has heard that it looks like you have done something wrong. Now give us your explanation. If you don't give a good explanation, you are going to jail. However, however, Ghana is a modern country. Parliament, led now by Alexander Afenyo Makin. Parliament is led by Afenyo Makin now. Parliament has passed the law that, listen, listen, Ghana, let's not do this to ourselves. If somebody has committed an offense and he says that I want to pay, allow him to pay. He has to just negotiate with the Attorney General. So they then wrote to the Attorney General, Attorney General, we know that you are in the lead. We know that your case has been made. But we want to accept plea bargaining. We want to pay. Okay. This is another letter here, 12th June. It's written to the Honorable Attorney General. It says, we refer to our previous correspondence on the subject, including your letter of 8th June. You stated in your letter that the revised terms of our client's proposal are unacceptable. Okay, they go on. Our client continues to hold an interest in having this matter resolved amicably. We will therefore be much obliged if you would advise the terms that your office would consider acceptable for our client's consideration. Our clients look forward to hearing favorably uh, from you on this one. Fantastic. This is the last letter that Samit Jemfi's guy, who is saying that uh, Attorney General has done uh, something, something. Uh, th- th- what Samit Jemfi's guy, who is saying that Attorney General has done something, something. That, that Samit Jemfi's guy. Uh, have they put Samit Jemfi's? Yes, Samit Jemfi is here. Samit, how are you? Please read the letter and Tuesday, bring it to the press conference. The, uh, the, the one that Samit Jemfi is saying that he says that 
the court is chasing him. The uh, attorney general is asking him to give some good account. He's the one begging. Please put the last letter on again. I'll come back to that. Put the last letter again. I think we have 10 minutes, don't we? We have 10 more minutes. Oh, but it's only 10.51. We have 10 minutes. We refer to our previous correspondence on the subject, including your letter. It says, you stated in your letter that the revised terms of our client's proposal are unacceptable. Our client continues to hold an interest in having this matter resolved amicably. We will therefore be much obliged if you would advise the terms that your office will consider acceptable for our client's consideration. Our client looks forward to hearing favorably from you. Now, the attorney general says he doesn't accept their terms. And they are asking that the attorney general should change. Uh, he should try and give them what he, what he would accept. They are so desperate that they want the plea bargaining. So they say, okay, if you don't accept these terms, tell us the one that you will accept. That's about it. That's, that's what they are saying. This is the matter. This is the whole matter. Now, let's go back and see uh, what Samir Jemfi said at the end of it. Let's hear the propaganda. Now, having seen all these viewers, now let's see what Samir Jemfi is saying. We are not surprised because we've always known that this is a stocking trade of Godfrey Yebo Adami. This is not a man who is interested in justice or the law. This is not a man who is an attorney general and minister of justice, no. This is a devious character with no honor whatsoever, no respect for justice, no respect for the rule of law, no respect for the rise of accused persons, and who always go about manipulating judicial processes to get his way at all costs. And so we are not surprised at all that today his saints have found him out. We are not surprised at all that today his cap is full. We are not surprised at all that today his day of reckoning has come. Because, you know, in a race between good and evil, evil can always take the lead, but good will always win. He's been doing this over and over again, and we have a cause to lament this to the media and the good people of this country time and again. You've been asking for evidence, here is your evidence. Godfrey Dame is not a minister of justice, but a minister for injustice. He is not interested in the rule of law, but interested in persecuting innocent people. He is interested in bending the law to have his way at all costs. And if he can go to a witness and seek to influence the witness, to quote the witness, coerce the witness, to testify, okay, in a manner that will help him achieve his aim, then he is capable of talking to a judge. He is capable of talking to a registrar. Okay, now we have, we have the story. You heard Sami Jinfi and the propaganda. He will not tell the journalist about this. He just comes to say a story that, oh, somebody said something, or something odious like that. Now let's get to the gossip story. Let's get, let's get to the gossip story. Okay, uh, producer, give me the photographs. Let me wrap it up quickly and we we'll go to text messages. Give me the photographs. Yes. So there's talk about a judge that, uh, according to the story that Samir Jeffy told Joy FM, that uh, where did he meet him? He met him in a judge's house. This is the conversation that they had. This, this is it. This is the story. The judge in question is his, his, his great lordship, the most respected uh, Justice Yoni Kulendi. And what is wrong with uh, Goffredami Dami goes to Justice Yoni Kulendi to meet with uh, Jakpa and tells him what he has to tell him. Jakpa is the one asking for meetings. Jakpa is the one writing plea bargaining requests to the Attorney General. Jakpa is the one sending the Attorney General text. Now, if they want, the text that Jakpa sent to the Attorney General, do they want us to publish it? It is coming. If Samit Jeffy comes on Tuesday, we will be here on Tuesday night. We will publish a text. Jakpa, the text you sent to Attorney General, we will put it on TV. They've told me that even my own, I shouldn't put it. This one will put it on. The text you were texting the Attorney General, the things you were telling him, begging that you want the matter, begging, begging, we will publish it. Ah, which this propaganda should be killed in this country. You are running elections, run elections. Do your campaign. Deal with politicians. Stop the lies. The propaganda, the lies, every time they are lying, propaganda. That's why we are here. We will not allow it. Whether it's NDC or MPP, we will not allow it. There are some culprits with propaganda. Samit Jeffy is one of them. He's the culprit of propaganda. Everything has to be, has to be sugar-coated and look like everything he says is to get people to be angry with somebody. That's all their life. They want to say something so that you are angry with somebody. Play the Samit Jeffy tape again. Listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to Samit Jeffy. 
The second one, the second one, play it again. We are not surprised because we've always known that this is a stock in trade of Godfrey Yeboadami. This is not a man who is interested in justice or the law. This is not a man who is an attorney general and minister of justice, no. This is a devious character with no honor whatsoever, no respect for justice, no respect for the rule of law, no respect for the rise of accused persons, and who always go about manipulating judicial processes to get his way at all costs. And so we are not surprised at all that today his saints have found him out. We are not surprised at all that today his cap is full. We are not surprised at all that today his day of reckoning has come. Because, you know, in a race between good and evil, evil can always take the lead, but good will always win. He's been doing this over and over again, and we have a cause to lament this to the media and the good people of this country time and again. You've been asking for evidence. Here is your evidence. Godfrey Dame is not a minister of justice, but a minister for injustice. He is not interested in the rule of law, but interested in persecuting innocent people. He is interested in bending the law to have his way at all costs. And if he can go to a witness and seek to influence the witness. To quote... You heard him. Look at the things he said about Godfrey Dame. Look at the things I've revealed here. Documentation. Please, all the journalists who want it, we are going to spread it out on our uh, social media page tomorrow. Uh, producer, let's do that tonight, right now when we close. As part of the thing we do post-production, let's put all the letters on our social media page. Every journalist, please, tomorrow morning, just come to Good Evening Official, get a letter. Samit Jeff is there, ask him the question. That does he know that the person that he says met Gofedami in Justice Kulendi's house and that he was told that he should try hard and make sure that they can get at Tufosin and that he will not be... Has he... Will, will he tell us that this is the same person who has written plea bargaining letters... He has written plea bargaining, letter one, failed. Letter two, failed. Now he says, Attorney General, whatever you want, you tell me whatever you want and let me do it. That's what it is. Letter one, Attorney General says, I'm not dealing with your guy. I'm not dealing, I'm not dealing with your guy. Uh, uh, that, that's letter one. Attorney General says, I'm not dealing with your guy. I'm not dealing with boot, deep sea, blue sea, whatever. De I'm dealing with accused persons. He comes and says, oh, I'm sorry. The accused persons know about this. They have agreed that and have confirmed. Attorney General says, the terms you brought, I don't want. Then they come and say, tell you, you tell us whatever you want, we will do. Anything you want. Because you know why they are in the court and they've seen the court process. They've seen their submission of no case collapse. And they've seen the prosecution leading them in the track. And they know they have to catch up with the prosecution. Otherwise, something significant is going to happen. This is the story. Nothing more, nothing less. Forget about Samit Defiance's propaganda. He's a nice man. He's my uh, uh, colleague from Christ Embassy. But when he comes to speak politics, let me remind Sami Jeffy that Godfrey Dami is not on the ballot. Oh. Godfrey Dami is not on the ballot. al Muhammad Muhammad Dubaumi, the one who has opened Kaya at Badina, he is the one on the ballot. He doesn't have a running mate yet, but he and Damboche is his campaign chairman. The two, Baumia is on the ballot. Yebo Adami is not on the ballot. Please, NDC police, are you fine with that? That the person on the ballot, not on the ballot, the one they are attacking. Okay. Mr. Jakwa, Captain Jakwa, and this is my Lord Justice Kulendi. Uh, uh, I end the story here. Let's go and see what people have on text message and then we'll continue the show. Fati, what are people saying? All right. So coming from Christian Danso, he says, it's imperative to always keep trial of hard evidence when you are dealing with the NDC due to the ability to twist facts. Coming from Christian again, he says, Sami Jemfi is never interested in the truth. His preoccupation is to peddle portrait propaganda. Now, Samuel Sunglo says, in the Honorable Atoforsen's case, the NDC, upon realizing they are losing, decided to pull out one of the funniest courtroom theatrics I've ever heard or read from them. I'm a lover of courtroom drama series. I have, however, never heard of this. The third accused today in court under cross-examination by Tamaklo alleged, albeit ludicrously, the AG, the Vulnerable Godfrey Dame, has reached out to him to twist his testimony to incriminate Atul Lafapo. Meanwhile, this same third person has on the three occasions in the past written to the AG seeking a play bargain, which the state has refused. He, on a letter dated 25th April 2023, wrote to the AG seeking 
to refund a sum of two million with a payment plan where he planned to first pay a sum of five thousand five hundred thousand euros and then later pay one point five million euros after six months. These are facts on record. How then would the AG turn around to ask you to twist the testimony to further incriminate Tonya Boato Forsen upon who a prima facie has already been established? And lastly, coming from Christian Dancer again, he says, I still can't fathom why the NDC appointed Ato Forsen as minority leader, knowing that the guy could be found guilty of wrongdoing. What do you have for us? Um, and he said, it's quite obvious that no well-meaning Ghanaian would be the spirit of presented by the NDC. The notion that a prosecutor would appeal to an accused individual to testify against the case in which they are implicated is simply absurd. It is difficult to comprehend why the NDC continues to struggle with logical reasoning. With the evidence at hand, the Attorney General doesn't need an additional superior evidence to secure a victory in this case. The available evidence is more than sufficient for even an inexperienced law student to win the case against Arthur Forsen. These strategies seem to be clear to be a clear attempt to delay the case, but such strategies will ultimately prove futile. The theoretical drama they are attempting to create in the courtroom has become has become has become tiresome and outdated. It is time for them to move past these antics and accept the reality of the situation. This is from Sandra. She says, Why would an AG who has arranged a deal with you rather hackle you in the court? Who does that? The third accused must provide a tangible evidence to back his claim. Otherwise, he should be jailed for contempt. This one is also from Kofi Miki. He says, Wow. Ato Fawcett is begging to pay 2 million euros to save him from jail, and we have NDC members defending him. NDC will make you morally corrupt indeed. Messi says, Paul, you are too much. And this lastly from Nyamecha, he says, Paul, the NDC have been waiting for an opportunity to hang the Attorney General from day one. He, he has been winning against them, and they cannot stand him. Antoinette, what do you have for us? Yes, yeah, so Elder Kutin Amos says, the NDC is trying desperately to repeat the same tactics and propaganda they used in 2008 just to confuse Ghanaian voters again. The Senin Ghanaians should see through their gimmicks now. At the end of the day, everyone knows Baumia is a visionary person and streets ahead of government official one, Nana Kutin Amo from Dewale. Um, Sadiq says, so why didn't the third accused person contact his lawyer when the attorney general wanted to meet him anyway? If he truly is truthful to his own lawyer, fellow Ghanaians, it was a planned and cooked story between the third accused and the NDC. Mercy Ejekun says the NDC is plotting to defame the honest attorney general for political gains, and these are actually very wild allegations. And lastly, Dauda Abu Bakar Sadiq says, Good evening, Paul. Attorney General and Minister for Justice, Honorable Godfrey Jebu Adame, is a man of rule of law. The NDC is not happy with the prosecutions going on against their appointees, that is the former NCA boss, four others charged with causing financial loss, former Maslow CEO. Mahama in 2020 said the NDC members are not scared of the OSP nor the Attorney General. We are not scared. And now comes again and says, support my appointees who may be prosecuted. Mahama, 31st December 2017. Angelo. You see watching us from Makum says, this plea bargain by Big C and its rejection by the AG was all over Ghana last year. I even wrote on Facebook that the Attorney General should reject every plea bargain and carry this case to its logical conclusion. He continues, now this Chakpa guy wants to hold in cause with lies, fabrication, pure fabrication, uh, typical NDC Machiavellian propaganda tactics. Uh, Aaron Jenny, watching us from New Jersey in the USA. Hello to you, Aaron. He says, uh, John Mahama gave out headpans to Kaya Ye, while Baumia puts up modern hostel with health facilities and skills training. Which one do you prefer if you are Kaya Ye? Aaron, you're being a bit... Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, the, this is from the Elephant Guards at UPSA. It says, good evening, Paul. Indeed, Dr. Baumia is a visionary leader who has gone at heart and has implemented progressive policies for the country. Again, okay, he makes the same... Uh, thing about headpans and then uh, the hostel facility. Also, Ahmed from Tamale says, so the NDC in this modern day of governance has a propaganda secretary. The NDC should ask the court for orders to get the telcos to present the voice calls between the Attorney General and Captain Retired Jackpa. Now, um, 
Okay, Rifat Hussein Gunu, again, he's talking about the comparison between headpans and the hostel facility. Okay, so lastly, we've got from... Uh, right, the message says, uh, great journalistic job, Paul Adimotri on the team of Good Evening Ghana. Thank you very much. Paul, back to you. I mean, I'm just getting a lot of texts from former journalists who are telling me that, ah, what is happening to our media people? As for today, you can't blame them too much. Sami JV walks out of court and says, duh, 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 and Tuesday is going to hold a press conference. Sami JV, Tuesday, bring your press conference, but bring the documents as well. You have to be, you have to show fidelity to the documentation. This is a legal process in court. You're a lawyer. Sami JV is a lawyer called to the Ghana bar. He's a solicitor of the Supreme Court of Ghana. He's been called to the bar, and he's acting as the propaganda secretary of a decent political party, the National Democratic Congress. In fact, the biggest opposition party. And a party that has been in government, I believe, more years than any other political party in the, in the history of the Fourth Republic. So, Sami Jefi, please do show fidelity to the documentation in the court process. Don't just come and put a microphone in front of you and speak propaganda because there's a ballot box in December. This is the problem I have. They are always thinking through ballot box. Okujita Blackwa thinks ballot box. Every thinking is ballot box. Yeah, they, they, I said something here. People said that I, didn't, I, I, I was too harsh. I said that because when they left school, they just came straight to politics. Everything they think about is ballot box. And that is how they are destroying the political fiber of this country. For those of us who have covered elections for a very long time, this kind of process is destroying the political fiber of this country. How do you just every, every day you are telling lies? Every day. And you know that what you are saying is untrue. You know that when the documentation comes, what you are saying will fall flat. But you are saying it because you are thinking about the ballot box of December. It is very unfair. It is very unreal. And it is almost immoral. Why should people do that? So if we are not here, all the media, nothing. They, will, they, they publish it today. There will be no investigation. There's nothing happening. Saturday, Koko Azar will come on news file and come and add. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Attorney General has done this and they will have some, they are lackeys talking about it. And then Tuesday, he'll do a press conference. You think that's how you're going to win ballot box? Yeah, you may win ballot box like that. But we'll still point out the fact to you that you are doing injustice. And that injustice will come back and hurt you. It will come back and haunt you. Those who conducted injustice in the past, you can see what they are doing today. How many you cover the NDC of Tony Edu? Tony Edu was very, very vitriolic against the MPP, but never will Tony Edu speak propaganda and lies. Never. Tony Edu has been on Talking Point. He's been on Searchlight. He's been on Good Evening Ghana. He's been everywhere. He speaks his firm position in his support for the National Democratic Congress. Never. Sam Piali. All those people we used to interview back in the day. Alaji Hudu Yaya. Uh, what's that guy's name? Bid Zidin. All those people we used to interview, they are NDC people. The people who brought Professor Mills to power in 2008. Guzitano, is he not an NDC person? What has happened to the NDC today? Every day, so could you talk black white and Samijin? Could you talk black white and they are speaking lies? Why? Because of ballot box. I have covered the NDC many, many times. I have been in the office of the National Security Minister, Tutubi Kwachi, hundreds of times. He will encourage all young men to come to his office. All young journalists, he will open his doors to. I have been in Tutubi Kwachi's office when he's having a conversation with Kwame Nahoy. They didn't feel that they should sack me because they are encouraging young people. That is the NDC. Kwame Nahoy, has he ever spoken like this before? That's you, Samit Evi, you have heard. Have you heard Kwame Nahoy talking like this before? Chachuchi Kata, whom even the morning generation know. Have you heard Chachuchi Kata talking like that before? Sami Okujeto, have you heard Chachuchi Kata talking like that before? Where is this character coming from? Where is the training coming from? Why are we losing the best of our politics? Why? What is the meaning of this? Then he said, they have some recording of Godfrey Dami. They record, every day they've recorded somebody. As for them, every day they've recorded somebody. And they have some recording. And on Tuesday, in his press conference, he'll show it. We are waiting for him. He should show it and I will photocopy the documents and give it to all the media there. He should answer why the man who says he's being cajoled to support the AG's case is the same man who is begging the AG to the point where now he says that, Attorney General, anything you want, I will do. He has written a letter with his signature on it. He said, Attorney General, anything you want, I will do. This is the same person telling the judge that Attorney General is, is calling me that uh, I should try and do the case so that he can jail her to force him. The Attorney General who is leading you in the track because he has won his submission of no case. Ah, what's the time? 10 minutes past 11. <laughs> you have some more text messages. Go through them and then let's, 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 let's get ready and, and wrap it up and go and enjoy our weekend. Today is Thursday. Let's go and find some place to dance. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, who should I start with? Antoinette, what are people saying? Um, Charles also says, Paul, your unparalleled analysis and understanding sets you apart from other journalists in Ghana. You are actually the best among them. God bless you. Um, Ibrahim Titus Glover and Christian Danso say intellectual analysis, this is a fact-based analysis, not conjecture and emotions. Um, Kwame Luri says, good evening, Paul, and my noble ladies. A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. Even the NDC nowadays is not good at propaganda. Where is Uncle a lot watching you live from Achim? And lastly, um, Goma Ibrahim says, Sami Jemfi is on a communist strategy as usual. His ranting would not even be a consideration of a level 100 constitutional law student. And lastly, Christian Danza says, I still can't fathom why the NDC appointed Atu Fosin as minority leader, knowing that he could be found guilty of wrongdoings. He says, Paul, I don't know why NDC politicians are bent on destroying. They do not come to put they do not come to put with their true facts, but they face the truth. They they want sorry, they do not want to come to put with the true facts, but and face the truth. They want to hide at the back of such lies. Okay. This is from June Ask. He says, The NDC guys are just not ashamed. How do we even get here in the first place? The NDC is a problem to Ghana's development. This is also from Sophia, and this is about the mental health issues. She says, in my career, I take care of people with mental health issues, and believe me, it is a challenge, and we need to understand that they are not different and are trying to make a difference in their own lives. We should therefore be there for them. This is also from Isaac. He says, good evening, Apostle Paul. You are doing extremely well, and I encourage you to keep going. Henceforth, you shall be part of our daily prayer. And lastly, from Elder. He says, NDC is trying desperately to repeat the tactics and propaganda they used in 2008 just to confuse Ghanaian voters again. Descending Ghanaians should see through their gimmicks now. At the end of the day, everyone knows Baumia is a visionary person and the streets ahead of government shall be an official one. This is from Nana Kumti from Delaware. Fati. Which I think is very interesting. How can he quickly and joyfully jump into conclusion because an accused person has allegedly said something against the Attorney General? How can you organize an entire press conference when the case is still ongoing? This looks too childish to me, especially when he has no evidence as a lawyer. Now, back to the Dr. Baumia's story on commissioning the Kayayos Hostel. Kweku Dennis says Dr. Mahmoud Baumia plays a significant role in Ghana's development and progress. He is influential in shaping policies and initiatives aimed at improving various aspects of the country. Now, coming from Junior Akbar from Tamale, he says, in fact, we are very proud of Dr. Baumia. He is a critical thinker. I think I need to move forward for now. I strongly believe that we need to move this nation forward. We have found somebody who thinks beyond. And lastly, coming from Barry Makofi of Paris, says, there have been two notable leaders from the northern region, one who served as president, that is John Dramani Mahama, and the other who served as vice president, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. A comparison of their leadership approaches reveals clear differences. During his presidency, leader A oversaw the allocation of 200 million cities under the Savannah Accelerated Development Authority program, also known as a confirm, which unfortunately yielded no tangible results, including the intended Guinea Fowl project. In contrast, Lida B, as vice president, has initiated a project to establish a hostel for the training and accommodation of Kayai headquarters, empowering them to acquire skills and become self-sufficient. Now to you, Angelo. Okay, so Lord from London quickly says, uh, Paul, keep exposing them because Joy FM and the others won't do what you're doing. And now Edmund from Koforidua wants to push back a little at you, Paul. He says, Paul, so you're telling the world that if someone is pleading with you to favorably consider a proposal from him, it is also not possible for you to give the person a conditioned precedence before you consider his or her plea. In other words, it can be true that all you have said about the plea bargain request is correct. However, it could also be true that the AG has requested the guy to do certain things as alleged so his plea bargain can be considered. I guess the point of the plea bargain alone is insufficient basis to say it is impossible for the AG to engage Mr. Jackpa as alleged. Thank you. Paul, back to you. 
All right, uh, we, we do have uh, gone past 11. Uh, sorry, we started the program late today, so we couldn't put all the content. We had sports content and all of that. Uh, so we can't do that because it's past 11. We're, we're getting off the show now. Uh, but Sunday, there's FA Cup final. Saturday, I should say. Saturday, there's FA Cup final. Remember that uh, before the FA Cup final, Prince William, the Prince of Wales, will be there, uh, most likely with his wife. And they'll sing our favorite song, Abide With Me, Manchester United. Uh, will be facing Manchester City in what looks like a very difficult tax uh, for the rest. But if Alex Ferguson is in the stadium, uh, the spirit of Alex Ferguson will help Manchester United to win. Thank you very much, viewers, for watching this edition of the show. We'll be back on another edition on Tuesday. Good night.